So I lost my train of thought there because uh, I looked down at the front of the Irish Independent and it's, um, it's Joe Duffy dressed as, I don't know what he's dressed as, but he's going to be the magic mirror in Snow White in the panto. Right, okay. That's, uh, that's a nice little mixer, isn't it? It's like uh, either get on the MC circuit, do a little bit of extra work or join a panto. And uh, he's opted for option C. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't. I never, never once thought of joining the panto. But maybe you too, when you know all goes well, you could have a career in panto. Well, if you need to fund that cloud responsibility, it might be a good option. So, is he going to be inserting like lines? Is he going to be saying, "Oh, I'm a w w sorry"? What's the character? The magic mirror. The magic mirror. Mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Oh, come on! There is an absolute banker for a talk to Joe line in there. Uh, in the show, he asks the evil queen to. Talk to Joe. Ah, but he makes matters worse when he can't tell her she's the fairest one of all. The part was written for Joe and he's hilarious, says the writer who wrote it about the actor he's hired to do the role that he's hired to get free publicity at the front of you. He's hilarious. We'll be the judge of that. We'll be the judge of how funny he is. Uh, yeah, I shall definitely be going to see how... Here's the thing. I might, I might actually end up having to go to this shit. That's what the cloud responsibility means, Owen. Well, I'm Sitting be... through dross like the Gaddy Panto. Is it? Well, uh, that's, uh, it's a really encouraging sign for my future there, that little glimpse into uh, the, the nether regions. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what landed everybody in trouble. Anyway, um, the uh, third episode of the Dadcast is out now, if you want to be saved from the, the uh, malevolency that is this show right now. Uh, yeah, okay, so we're going to take you through the newspapers. That's what we do every morning at this time. O'Neill admits Ireland are struggling on very big pitch. If the game's in Croke Park tonight, did you not know, lads? It's been moved from the Aviva to Croker, and it's a huge, massive pitch. We all know, even though it's actually the same dimensions as loads of other pitches around the country, psychologically, Croker is just so hard for these lads to get their head around. Well, Roy Keane's got the reconnaissance from Parky Cueve a couple of weeks ago to know what a, a big, massive pitch is like. So hopefully that'll help the Ireland team out. What does he mean by that? Technically, we're short. We know that. I think everybody can see that. But we're not short of heart. Ah. Uh. It's, uh, it's like that scene in the Mitchell and Webb show. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen the sketch where uh, it's uh, Webb who's sitting outside. He's doing kind of like the Anton Deck job outside after a talent show. And somebody comes out with a Manchester accent and is like, I put my heart and soul into this. And he's like, well, if you put a little bit more practice into it and you actually uh, <laughs> learnt the words of the song and you weren't so shit at singing, maybe your heart and soul wouldn't have been the only thing. It does sort of uh, remind me of uh, Martin O'Neill's press conferences before these games. That We're going to put our heart and soul into it. But maybe if we practice our lines, we might actually get the results. It's hard to know what to do, though, because if he, if he was to come out and like be a, you know, a, a circus hailer shouting about how great we are, we'd all be like, that man is delusional. Like, look at how crap our team is. What can you do? It's true, and I guess a, a bit of realism is something that we can all associate with. It's something that we appreciate, and like, there's, a, there's an admirable element to that as well. But like, when it comes to the Nations League, I'm sick of saying this, we're playing teams that are on a similar level to us, or are supposed to be a similar level to us. The way Martin O'Neill is talking, we're overachieving by being in League B. But, but maybe we are, maybe he's right. Maybe we deserve to be in League C. I don't know, like when we go, went into this tournament, particularly in, in the last week, when it became clear that Christian Eriksen was going to be absent, and now for tonight's game, that Gareth Bale, Aaron Ramsey and Ethan Lampadu are going to be absent. Not only do I see that as a level playing field, I see that as sort of an opportunity for us to go and win these games. I mean, suddenly Ampadu, who's like played one good game in his life, his loss is like, wow, we really have a chance to win now. This teenager, he's played one good game. We're like, wow, he killed us before, but it has reached a stage where it's a bit ridiculous that we're happy that Ethan Ampadu is out. Or that it is, and you're right to point it out, that it might have a material impact on the outcome of the game. It, well, I would say any midfielder who can string a pass together has he a material impact in the game against you know? Ireland. Uh, Munster sweat over Earls as Ireland winger set for scan and hamstring. So suddenly, Keith Earls and the New Zealand game are being talked about in dispatches. Uh, obviously, Earls was picked to play last weekend, but did his um, hamstring in the warm up, and um, Darren Sweetenham ended up starting in the game in Exeter. So, for the visit of Gloucester, it looks like Earls is going to miss out this weekend. Um, and there are some other injury news. Um, Sammy Arnold is going to see a, a second specialist about his throat injury, but Van Granis hopefully it won't rule the centre out for too long. Conor Murray obviously still sidelined, and Albie Matthewson is also unlikely to recover from his knee injury. And the Ross is in danger, it has no sponsor at the moment, so hopefully somebody can get behind the Ross and we can come back to uh, that, uh, that story. O'Neill, we lack ability but not heart. We're shit but we're Irish.
is basically the subtext. And we'll go out there and we'll fight. We'll die in the trenches. We'll die on that hill, even though it's the wrong hill. Uh, two stars back as Toha leaves. Galway and Louth have been lifted by the return of talent from Australian rules football, while Derry's Anton Tohill is going in the opposite direction. Um, Anthony Tohill did have a spell in the AFL as well, but did obviously come back to then go on and win an All-Ireland with Derry and also have a trial with Man United. So maybe it's not a complete disaster. Anton is 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> Played for Derry under 20 this year and has time on his side to learn the oval ball game, it says here from Paul Keane. Uh, it's terrible if you're Derry that, like, you know, Oh, look, that guy, he's Anthony Toll's son. Ooh, look at the size of him. Yeah, he's got all the ball skills. Screw you, Australia. Yeah, it's, it seems that every prodigious talent in Derry at the moment is just getting taken. Uh, like you see Conor Glass a couple of years ago as well. It's, uh, like, like, you do wonder if it's kind of worth bringing up these kids to say, look at this thing over here, the shining light of, uh, a, prof- or of a potential professional and uh, the AFL suddenly swoop in and take your man. If it's kind of like a, an element of maybe keeping things under wraps for a few more years, they, they might have a better chance of succeeding. But obviously, in Anton Tohill's side, this is a, a massive opportunity for him and, and good luck to him. Like, did Anthony not make it in um, the know. AFL? Was <clears throat> it a situation where he went down for a trial and didn't get a full professional contract? He had a spell with the Melbourne Demons in the 1990s. It says, I can't remember the specifics of it. But um, So Dermot McNichol went down and played a couple of years from Derry and he would have been the first one around that era that you can remember going down and coming back. And he came back with just like this beefy hulk of a man. Um, but it's so, like Kildare obviously benefited from having a bunch of players go away and come back. It feels like they benefited and that they were introduced to the professional lifestyle. Um, I don't know, maybe they, maybe they would have developed into different types of players if they hadn't gone. Who knows? It's a high-risk game, though, given the attrition of sport down there. People coming back absolutely crocked is another danger. But if you can fine-tune yourself, Tommy Walsh, yeah. obviously, he's only getting his, uh, his sporting life back together now, it seems. Uh, front foot. O'Neill admits safety first approach won't be enough against Wales. No, it sure won't. Another nil-all draw just ain't going to cut the... Uh, so he ain't going to pass muster for us today. And then I didn't realise it was 50 years to the day since um, the protest in Mexico. I guess that would make sense, wouldn't it? The Tommy Smith and um, John Carlos protest, um, which is obviously an iconic moment in world sport. Um, so Tommy Smith wins gold, John Carlos wins bronze. They have uh, different hands raised because they had one pair of gloves between them. And then the Australian runner, who is um, Peter Norman. Uh, Peter Norman has a pretty interesting story as well that has been told on various occasions. But if you don't know anything about that um, Tommy Smith, John Carlos story, it's worth getting the examiner out today, page 12. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry, I have two more to do for you. Uh, so, <laughs> again, kind of capturing the mood is uh, Emmett Malone. Little in O'Neill's pre-match words to get anyone's hopes up. <laughs> <laughs> that picture of Callum O'Dowda, oh my God. Yeah. It is, uh, Even if you've been sitting under Johnny Walters instead of uh, Duffy, he was like... Hash- well, like Don't tell anybody, we're screwed. You could definitely say that Callum O'Dowda there is hashtag mad serious. He is, yeah. Uh, and then Richard Kyo. The return of Richard Kyo, I think, is something we can all get behind. Yeah, like he uh, plays with a bit of charisma. And that's not. Uh, that seems like a throwaway phrase, but it's like whenever he's on the ball, something's going to happen. Yeah. Good or bad, at least we're, we're paying attention. Exactly. I'm like one of the few players you're paying attention to when we have the ball. I, I look up and I, I, my phone. I stop checking my Instagram stories whenever Richard Keogh is on the ball, basically. There's a great Donald McRae interview with Stephen Hendry. He's got a book out about, um, about his complete dominance of the sport. So he won seven world championships in ten years and is in two other finals. So the fact that he ends up getting beaten uh, in those other finals when he's at such a high level of dominance is amazing. But he, he admits that um, he was a bit of a dick. Like... And when he stopped being a bit of a dick, he started going out with uh, fellow snooker players, like for dinner and having chats with them. That lost that his um, sense of invincibility disappeared, and they started to beat him. But then it just completely got in his head, and after a while, he couldn't make shots anymore. He says that you're supposed to accelerate through the cue ball, but he stopped accelerating through the cue ball and couldn't play the game. Got so inside his own head that he couldn't play the game until eventually he um, has to qualify. Kind of. It's not even in the Crucible. So remember, this is like the king of the Crucible, like the greatest player the game has ever seen. And then he's in qualifying, battles his way through qualifying, and in his first frame back in the, in the Crucible has a 147. Everybody goes, wow, this guy's back. But he was like, yeah, of the 26 pots or whatever it is for a 147, I only hit five of them properly. And I knew <laughs> in that moment that I was dead. 
that like even even this last great couldn't enjoy it. But um, is that snooker yips right there? Well, don't don't use the word yips on because that trivialises it. He actually he's asked about the yips. And he's like, no, that trivialises. It's far deeper than that. Um, but it's uh, it is pretty interesting, you know. Um, Nothing trivial about the yips, I would say. Because Henry, well, he thinks it's trivial. It's because it's it's such a say that to a golfer. It's such a bad description of it, you know. It's like, uh, yeah, no, I I agree. If you you know if you were to get Henry and Harrington to have a chat, that would be an interesting kind of yeah, it'd be great. Oh, there's nothing trivial about it, buddy. Nothing trivial about it. Are you, what are you trivialising me? Um, so look, I don't know. That uh, Donald McRae piece is good, but I I would not have been interested in reading a Stephen Henry book until you actually see like yeah, I, I love being world number one I hear now other people saying that oh I'm there to be shot at but like I wanted to crush people I wanted to be the best um, I never I had to force myself to smile when I won titles because I expected it it's like Tiger kind of like yeah I just won this I mean what's the big deal of course I won I'm the best um, so but Henry obviously predates Tiger Woods and had that level of uh, wanted to crush you mm. he makes some comparisons with Ronnie in the piece to see uh, yeah, he's saying that uh, O'Sullivan also doesn't hang out with any of his um, yeah. opponents and so therefore has that kind of uh, sense of detachedness. I think that's a little bit different though, isn't it? I think does Ronnie O'Sullivan just shows sort of, to a certain extent in his career, has different times a level of disdain for the sport. And uh, that might be a bit different where Hendry was uh, a bit more of disdain for his opponents rather than the actual sport itself. Uh, we haven't talked about Gervan Grobler coming back to uh, Townland Park. This week it'll be interesting to see. Um, I presume he's going to get the great response from the Munster fans that he was getting when he was coming off the bench. Yeah, I presume so. Like I can remember the first game he came off the bench last year, after everything kind of blew up the story around him, and everybody suddenly became aware of Grobler's backstory. That when he did come off the bench that evening at Thomond Park, he got a massive reception. It was the biggest cheer of the night. I think they were playing Zebra or maybe it was Treviso. Can't quite recall, but yeah, you'd expect. Uh, a hero's return for Gerber and Grobler in Munster this weekend. It'll be interesting to see exactly what happens there. Hey, let's move on. I'm looking forward to that. Game you can hear live on Off the Wall. Uh, so, our ace cracksman ready to put on a show, Anthony Oppenheimer, owner breeder of Saturday's Kipco Champion Stakes favourite cracksman, yesterday welcomed the rain that fell at Ascot over the weekend and relished the prospect of his soft ground loving star taking on stable mate Roaring Lion. And then the stars are out tonight. Absence of Bale and Ramsey points to tight Nations League contest in Dublin. I think it could well be a nil all draw this morning or this evening. What do you think? That's a very big prediction there, Ger. I can't believe you're putting your neck out like that. I think that it could. Or, or they could a hammer us. A nil all draw involving the Republic of Ireland. Could they hammer us? No, of course not. They have never hammered us in recent memory, have they? Oh, wait, they did last month. Like, you're, you just covered all bases there. What are you going for? Well, I'm, I'm definitely not covering that we could win the game. Base. Could we win the game? Of course we can. I know. Can oh, we? Will we? No. I mean, listen to this for a team. It's going to be Joe Allen and Andy King in midfield, and then phew, I don't know if we can. It's Tom Lawrence, David Brooks, Tyler Roberts, and Sam Vokes. If that is not a front four to chill you, then I don't know. I mean, I'm terrified. It's almost like the time that Overmars, Clivert, Van Nistelrooy, Van Hoydunk, and a bunch of others were rocked up. Mm. It's like Firmino, Salah, and Mane, except it's four people. <laughs> That's what that is. Uh, back page of the Herald is My Dragons Will Roar. Gig says Wales will be up for the fight. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, David Brooks like going up to Richard Keogh and going roar <laughs> and, or something like that, making uh, some sort of impersonation of a, a dragon. Uh, we are terrified the dragons are in town. Uh, Standing Firm says the back page of the Irish Daily Mail. Nations League is still all to play for, says O'Neill. While Sterling double stuns Spain, Fogarty, we have to ignore the hype. That's John Fogarty admitting that complacency is a, a big cause for concern for Leinster should it seep into the camp, but he's not saying it is seeping into the camp. Back page of the Irish Daily Star is Crazy Heart. O'Neill hails McLean Passion ahead of face-off with Wales. Then it's tab of the morning to you on the back page of the sun. Beam me up, Scotty, says uh, the back page of this particular newspaper. Hogan is ready. Uh, in probably the best Star Trek reference we're going to give you this morning. Yeah, 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 okay. Back page of the mirror is Strikers Wanted. O'Neill may call on his reserves in desperate search for some goals. As I said at the top of the show, I've made myself available. If you need a striker, uh, a striker you shall get. On to the 
UK back pages and the UK back pages we shall go. Can I get a copy of the Times there? Because the UK back pages this morning are, are just amazing. They're really absolutely sensational because last night was one of the greatest nights in the history of sport. Let's start with Henry Winter in the London Times this morning. It was as good as a 5-1 win over Germany, reads the headline here. Ah, oh, the bang of the 5-1. I knew that, I, that, I, I, like, watching Twitter last night, I was like, ooh, this is, this is their new 5-1. It is. The rain in Spain seemed to have descended on Andalusia, but the pitch was fine, and England skimmed across the surface like speedboats in the first half. It was one of those rare, unforgettable halves when England played like kings, confident and merciless and with Sterling looking a world-beater. It was a thrilling half of football to rival the destruction of Denmark in the round of 16 at the 2002 World Cup, when England also scored three before half-time. England's first half pyrotechnics were even more dazzling than Michael Owen's skewering of the Danes in Niigata. The first half bore a legitimate comparison with the second period of the famous 5-1 triumph in Munich in 2001, with the three unanswered goals after the break. It was a sensational night for the English. Uh, Daniel Taylor in The Guardian as well, uh, hopping on board the hype train. Uh, as you've got every right to do, I guess, as a sports writer uh, writing about your team, any win against Spain is to be celebrated. But to overcome one of the world's most refined teams on their own soil makes this, without any exaggeration, one of the great nights in England's modern history. Even more remarkably, this was England's youngest team since 1959, which is a pretty good stat. So England in dreamland is the back of the Guardian. Um, was Declan Rice tweeting last night? Uh, he wasn't tweeting <laughs> last night. Did anybody check Declan yeah. Rice's tweets or Instagram account? Or like, you know... He would bring that average age down even further. He could have your youngest team ever. If you and he'd get in the team. Yeah, he would. Uh, Sam Wallace as well, um, saying that Viva the UEFA Nations League, which gave us one of the greatest international games outside tournament football in history. And uh, finally, Paul it's not, Hayward. It's not wrong, is it? In the I mean, Telegraph. Like everybody on Twitter last night was raving about this game. Well, Paul Hayward lands the killer blow here. On a soggy night, it was raining goals for Sterling and Marcus Rashford, which is just pure poetry. Redeemed Sterling uh, is the front of the Telegraph sports section. That could be us if only we won games in the Nations League. Or if, you know, we'd invested in youth football 10 years ago. Ah, never mind that. The like, Nations League, Trump like did. Um, there's a few things, right? The back of the star. The, did, did you mention the son of Ireland? Or oh, England? sorry, yeah. Stephen Ireland's oh, yeah. son's going to play for England. Stephen Ireland's son, Joshua, has been called up for international duty by England. Wait a uh, the Stoke City teenager has been drafted into the England under-15 squad for an upcoming friendly later this month. Maybe we should make a, you know, an attempt to try and get at least the, the children of our internationals. Kwame Ampadu's son, Stephen Ireland's son. This guy's going to be, like, astonishingly good. He'll be the perfect passing midfielder that England have always needed. We need this guy. We need to get Stephen Ireland back. Let's call him up. Let it, let it, let... Let this son see the dad play one last time in a green shirt. Make peace. Why not? How ironic would it be if Stephen Ireland's son ended up being the most patriotic Irishman of all time? I was like, no, nah, I want to play for my country all the time. Or England's best player, which is more likely at this stage. Probably more likely. Uh, the other thing is here, it says, there's a story saying, Glazers snub to Saudis. Man United's owners have told Saudi Arabia investors they are not interested in selling the club. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, whose family is worth around 965 billion, is reported to want to match Abu Dhabi's ownership of Man City and Qatar's backing of PSG by buying United. That's the story in the back of the Star, but there is a story in the back of one of the other papers, which I can't actually find at the moment, that says the Grants are, um, the Glazers rather, are actually headed to Saudi Arabia next week for talks. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, an interesting time in Saudi Arabia. Inter like, great time to go to Saudi Arabia is what I mean. Nothing to do with the political situation, just November is a cracking time to go. Yeah, weather's much better than it is in, in deep summer. Yeah, that's it. That's the only factor you really need to take into account when you visit that country at the moment. <laughs> um, all right, that is us through the newspapers this morning. Oh, There's the Irish News is one left and I've got one comment for you as well. So give us the Irish News there. Uh, so the Irish News, GA, no plans to change our punishment for on-field violence. Um, so we're going to speak with Jack Anderson a little bit later on. This is a Carol Kane story who says that uh, it was also confirmed that counties had... You know, we'll come back to the, the specific details of that, but the plan is that there won't be any specific change at the moment for on-field violence. Um, GA says there's no plans to make a widespread change with rulebook regarding how on-field violence is dealt with, but that they would not be found wanting if counties felt their hands were tied by its constraints. So, um, that's the details of that. There is a, a couple of other stories, uh, just very quickly, on uh, boxing. Floyd Mayweather has, uh, I guess, 
voice his interest in fighting Khabib Nurmagomedov in the, the boxing ring. Uh, this is a headline from The Guardian that he screenshotted, put on his Instagram and says, CBS Showtime and MGM Grand, get the checkbook out. Uh, so uh, that's going to that's gonna happen. Like, it's, it is quite ironic that uh, if we saw Khabib get into this bout with uh, Floyd Mayweather and in the press tour got even more racist than Conor McGregor got and got even more vitriolic and I was like, yeah, the, the whole facade of me being offended by Conor McGregor's words were all a lie. And I actually love trash talking, but that's probably not going to happen. It's probably going to be a very boring build-up and an average fight. Do you think it'll happen? Uh, uh, but lots of things there. It's, uh, it's a live possibility. Like if Mayweather says, give it the green light, then it, it gets a green light, no? I guess if you're Mayweather, you like nothing to lose because you know you're going to just win the fight. Yeah. And he won't be able to do anything to you. But that's, gonna, that's not going to get him as big a payday as a McGregor fight. Would people be interested? I mean, I guess they would. I don't know. I mean, would you be interested in watching Khabib against McGregor? Mayweather, I don't, like, Mayweather's last bunch of fights were no good anyway. But there still seems to be a, an appetite to watch people to watch him bore you over 10 to 12 rounds. But the thing is, it'll be a bigger mismatch than the McGregor fight. Like, I mean, it might not be any bigger mismatch. It's hard. It, it might not be. It, weren't we told, I know we didn't really see much of the boxing on show in UFC 229, but weren't we told before that that Khabib's not much of a boxer? He's got that big right hand, though. <laughs> Darren, how are you? Good morning, Ger. Are you uh, excited about the Republic of Ireland? I just got I? some tickets right now. Did for you? The game. Yeah. Right. Well, right. How did you manage to get your hands on them? <laughs> oh, they, he literally couldn't give them away. I won't shame who in the office decided not to go. But he uh, said, would anyone like to go to the match tonight? And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of interest. So it got awkward for a second. I said, I'll take them. Oh, yeah. Really are a magnet for the gold dust. <laughs> yeah, those, yeah the, the good stuff. Those tickets are gone. Darren has taken them. Darren might not yet show up. I will show up. I will show up. If I've got the tickets, my intention is to go. Yeah, well, look, I mean, the country needs support, particularly at its weakest moment. How grim is it, though, that like, you, you're not that enthused by going to see Ireland play? There was a time where no matter how bad the team was, you'd still, you'd still get up for it. Even during the Staunton time, like there was the Crow Park factor, there was a bit of excitement around the team, even though they were a worse team than this team now. Do you remember how bad the games were in Crow Park? That Wales game was one of the worst games of football I've ever seen. And Stephen Ireland. That was the 1-0 I mean, Craig Bellamy game, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Stephen Ireland's great. English son. Irish heart, English blood. What's the Smith song? Uh, that's it, it there. That yeah. is the name yeah. of the title. That's, uh, yeah. you've, you've named it there. You've answered your own question. Martin O'Neill? Yeah. He's going on the attack for a change, but it's off the pitch because he's been defending his record over the past four years after heavy losses to Wales and Denmark in recent months. The pressure has been mounting on the former Celtic boss. Tonight they face Wales in the Nations League at the Aviva Stadium. O'Neill has been defending the players, saying he's doing the best with what he has to work with and he believes he is still the man to get the best out of them. One, they want to play for the country. That's really, really important, of course. And now most players do, to be fair, but this group of players certainly in my time here, have shown an incredible willingness to do it. None more so than uh, if you look at uh, James McLean, who, um, who broke his wrist in training the day before we played, um, the day before we played uh, Wales, and he actually was looking for an injection, an injection to see if he could play in the game with a broken wrist. Um, it's James is obviously sometimes not right in the head, but um, he is absolutely brilliant for us. He's got the and he epitomises everything about what this side has been over the last number of years. And we wouldn't have got. I will say this: we wouldn't have got to where we've got. We technically were short. I don't know technical ability. We're short. I don't think anybody in the auditorium would see this. We're technically short. We're not short of heart. We have. We were well beaten last month. In the game, but the, the players have given absolutely everything they possibly can for the cause. Technically, we're short. Reminds me of the last days of trap. A little bit. He would do an awful lot of that stuff. Nonne Campione was yeah. his line at the Euros. We're at the Euros, like pointing at us, the pudgy Irish journalist, Nonne Campione. And the Italians are like, oh, you, oh, you're such a genius. I mean, look, look at these guys. Look at us. Like, <laughs> well, why? Were the Italian journalists... Uh, Well-dressed, suave, debonair, uh, tanned, healthy-looking, you know. Oh, espresso love drinking. Trust. Definitely not the Irish journalists. I he used to single a journalist and make a point to him. I remember him telling Emmett Malone one time, Emmett, this is not Brazil. And Emmett didn't even ask the question. He just looked at him <laughs> and told him. This is oh, not Brazil. Brazil uh, is there. We are not there. Imagine we're like... Pining for trap. <laughs> <laughs>
It's not that bad yet. Um, it makes matters worse when our near neighbours do so well because England have kept up their hopes of reaching the Nations League final alive with an impressive 3-2 victory over Spain. Raheem Sterling scored a brace either side of Marcus Rashford's strike to give Gareth Southgate's team a 3-0 half-time lead. They did make it a little bit hard for themselves in the second half. Two goals from Paco Alcazar and Sergio Ramos uh, put them back into it and um, football may be coming back home. I don't know, did you see Kyle Walker's tweet? No. The Nations League is coming back home. <laughs> <laughs> at least he's got a sense of humour about it. At least he's got a sense no, of humour. No, he's being fully serious. Mm. He's got a sense of humour about it. Um, Northern Ireland fell to a third defeat on the bounce. <clears throat> they lost to Bosnia-Herzegovina, a double from Edin Dzeko, secured a 2-0 win for the hosts in Sarajevo. While well, 18-time All-Ireland winner Rena Buckley has given a fascinating insight into the discrimination that female sports people face, the Cork legend shared a story yesterday about attending a medal presentation in the county last year. She was the first woman in Cork to skip her camogie in football inter-county teams to All-Ireland success. She's won a record-breaking 18 All-Ireland medals across both codes. She was told by a club official that they didn't want her to present medals to under-12 boys, only under-12 girls. I suppose in my mind I thought there was this huge shift after coming in women's sport. I remember last year I was asked to, to present medals to a club team in, in West Cork. Um, so the boys and girls had come together and they had won the under-14 championship in, in ladies football and the under-12s in boys. So they asked me to come down and present the medals. So I, I went along... Um, and when I got down there on the night, um, the guy who asked me took me aside and he said, look, we're really sorry, but like the GA team actually don't want you to present the boys with the, with the medals. Um, this is like an under-12 boys team, you know. So <laughs> that was absolutely fine, you know. They, they got some local guy to do it. Um, he was absolutely mortified, like, you know, he, he could hardly look at me. He was really embarrassed. But that's just the, the mindset of whoever was organising that, so like we're looking for a shift in that, and that's a rare thing now, but it does happen, that was 2017, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't 1986, like that was 2017. So we're looking for this massive shift, and I suppose this is looking to accelerate that as quickly as we can, um, and I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. That's madness. <laughs> Like, you're a Cork legend. You've got 18 All-Ireland medals. That, that is madness. And it's, it's, it is terrible that this happened. Because it's obviously not the 12-year-old kids who are deciding it. No, no, no. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Buckley shared her story at the launch of the 20 by 20 campaign, a movement aimed at increasing the media coverage, attendances and involvement in female sports by 20% by the year 2020. More on the hashtag 20x20. Well, Paul Mannion has described a number of suggested changes to the playing rules of Gaelic football as bad ideas. A number of measures will be trialled in the Allianz League next season, among them a restriction on hand passes, a plan to have all sideline kicks forward, the introduction of an attacking mark, the return of the sin bin and a new confusing kick kick-out rule. Mannion not convinced. He's told the 42.ie that the new rules could cause chaos. He says, I personally think that they are a really bad idea, to be honest. I completely understand they are only proposals and just suggestions, so we won't know until a few of them are trialled, but my initial thoughts were just that they were pretty bad ideas. Yeah, I think that's uh, carried around a lot of the newspapers as well this morning, those quotes from Paul Mannion. It's, the, the more time has gone on, the more... I think we've kind of woken up to the idea that, oh God, no. If this, if this was all brought together all at once, it would be a bad spectacle for the future of Gaelic football. I'm up for trying them just to see what happens. I just want to be fully sure that these are bad ideas, but the fear is that Paul Manning might be right. I mean, the first four are, are reasonable suggestions on maybe quickening up the game and changing the way it's played, but then the fifth one just is... Which the fifth one? Kicking over the 45? The, 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 the rules about who's where for the kickouts. Yeah. It's, it's just going to be so... Well, what if it's a windy day? Well, yeah, we, we talked about this. Made right that point before, yeah, the, the biggest boot in the world of sport couldn't kick the ball out 45 metres because the wind was blown. Um, so I was like, is that, is that automatically a throw in every time there's a kick out? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be any kind of real world scenarios trial in this. And Mannion also makes the point in a lot of the quotes he was speaking at um, uh, an event in promotion of the, the Dublin Championship, and he made the point that. How did they arrive at this? You know, what well, practical fairness, measures did they take to arrive? In fairness, at this? like they, they did a lot of work and they talked to Rob Carroll, the statistician, and like it, it is definitely a bunch of people who really care about the game. Ultimately But who don't play the game? Uh, no, there were player representatives. Court. There were players' representatives on the on the standing rules committee, um, or the committee who were doing it. Um, was it not David Collins? Is it not? David Collins was involved, I think. Yeah. yeah. 
<coughs> Leave Brian Cuthbert involved as well, who would have been managing very, very recently as yeah. well at the top level. So look, whoever whoever comes up with whatever rule changes are, it's definitely worth trialling rule changes to see if it improves the game. But the real problem is that the championship structures are screwed, and as a result, you don't see teams who are of equal standard play against each other, except until you get to the Super 8s. And as we've seen, the Super 8s has two meaningful weeks of games, and the third one frequently is not that meaningful. So it's such a short season of good quality matches. The league, there's no one really complains too much about the rules during the league, do they? When you actually have teams of equal standard up against each other. The games are decent. Yeah, they are. Like, uh, I, I, uh, like I would contend that some of the games that we saw between equal standing teams in this year's championship, well, even, the best the, even like, oh yeah, well, they're good games. I, I would contend if you take those alone, it was like a pretty good year. Like it's not being spoken about it as a good championship at all because it's just a volume of crap that just completely uh, lingers in our memory over everything else. And like people will say that the Super 8 was a bad idea. I'm not necessarily sure that that's the case. I want to give that a couple of more years, see how that proceeds. Like, if Mayo had got through to the Super 8s... Who uh, said the Super 8s were a bad idea? Well, the, uh, people... Are, like, I think the general uh, consensus around the Super 8s this year has been that it wasn't exactly a fantastic spectacle of football. It, it wasn't didn't, a, a it didn't fix festival things. of football. It didn't fix things, no. But, like, it, it definitely suffers from comparison for having the best hurling matches yes. early. Like, if the best football matches... If you started with good football matches, and they were like, oh, the football season's really good. Whereas the hurling season was sensational. I was like, well, this is no hurling. It's like... It was far better. There were more good, even, evenly matched teams playing good games than there have been. There's a load of problems with it. Dublin having two matches in Croker, the first round being in Croker instead of at local grounds. Easily fixable things. Like, but we're going to rip up the rule book and make it so teams can't hand pass three times in a row, and that's going to fix everything. But like, we do need rule change uh, if, if we, at some level. Like we, we had this conversation with Niall Moyne a few weeks back and maybe the exact function of the rules that he suggested and that this committee has suggested aren't the correct ones, but there is like skills. Like You can see why they brought in the idea of the 45 metre kick out. Obviously it's a terrible idea because it's never going to work in practice, but they want to get some sort of renaissance of the high catch going. The problem is though, when one rule doesn't work, they'll just bin all five of them well, that's the and thing. start again. They will say, oh no, we tried five rule changes, they didn't really work, so we'll start again. Uh, two players confirmed their return from the AFL this week. Kieran Byrne and Killian McDade have left Carlton. Byrne spent five years in Australia, having left Loud at 18. Injuries interrupted his career though. He played for St. Moctis in their Loud intermediate final defeat of St. Feckins on Sunday, but he damaged his ankle. He's facing another spell on the sidelines now. The Galway man McDade joined Carlton a year ago, but leaves without making a senior AFL appearance. 18-year-old Anton Tohal has signed a two-year contract with the AFL side Collingwood. He's the son of former All-Ireland winner Derry Star Anthony. He stands at 6'6 tall and he will travel in November for training out of the start of the Aussie Rules season in March. He's following in the footsteps of his dad who, as Jer mentioned earlier, played with Melbourne Demons in the early 90s. Sarah Rowe also heading down under as well. She's been talking to Off the Ball about next year and signing a deal with Collingwood. Yeah, off to Australia in two and a half weeks, so um, it's coming down my throat now at this stage. So really looking forward to it. Um, a big challenge ahead, lots to learn, but um, also a great opportunity that I'm really looking forward to. What is it about the challenge that attracted you to it? Um, I suppose I've played soccer um, at international level and then played with Mayo and to try excel in another sport and have that opportunity to play professional, which is something I've never done, was something that really attracted me towards the sport. and to become the best version of me and be in an environment where I have all the facilities in place to excel. So um, it's going to be a big challenge, but it's to be able to play professional at any level is just a massive opportunity. So I have to grab it with both arms. Great night for the Galway gymnast Emma Slevin. She capped off a good week at the Youth Olympics with a fifth place finish in the women's balance beam. Slevin says she exceeded all expectations by making it to four separate finals. Two Irish boxers can secure at least silver medals today. Dean Clancy faces Great Britain's Ivan Price in the semi-finals. That's the men's flyweight division. Dervla Rooney in the semi-final action in the women's featherweight class. On the track, Miriam Daly goes in heat two of the women's 400 metres hurdles. Well, finally, Snooker and Ronnie O'Sullivan has raised concerns about the venue for the English Open. He has branded the K2 Leisure Centre in Crawley as a hellhole and claimed he could smell urine in the players' interview area. <laughs> a five-time world champion says the event organiser, World Snooker, is cutting corners by selecting the venue. O'Sullivan was speaking after winning his opening match. He told the BBC, It's such a bad venue, it demotivates you to want to play. <laughs> This is about as bad as I've ever seen. It's a bit of a hellhole, he added. I don't know what this gaff is, but I've just done an interview and all I can smell is urine. At least he says urine instead of piss. Good stuff, Darren. Thanks very much for that.